friends. So I've read a lot of books this year. As of recording this video shortly before New Year's, I have read around 140 books. Some may look at that number and go, hey, that's a lot of books. And I really enjoy the things I read for the most part, but I read very few books that I would consider to be five star reads. For me, the qualifications to be a five star read is really straightforward. I only buy books that I want to reread. So a five star book is a book that I liked so much that I really want to sit with. So I will put that book on my wish list of books I want to purchase so that I can reread that book. Most of the books I read are four star books and there's nothing wrong with that. I really like them, they're fun, I could recommend them to other people, but I'm not gonna go out and buy them for myself. I don't have that kind of disposable income. I did notice some pretty transparent trends while making this list. For starters, the books I reread, like the original run of Miss Marvel or The Hate You Give, were still five star books for me, which is good because I bought them and reread the copies that I own. So I won't be talking about the books I reread this year, but instead talking about the books I read for the very first time in this video. Another theme I noticed in the books that I gave five stars to is that about half of them were written by Asian authors. I'm Asian American, so it's not super surprising that I like books that I see parts of myself in. It's just an interesting note. It is possible that this is the first year where the majority of the five star books I read were written by non-white authors though, largely because I've intentionally made the choice to seek out books from the Asian diaspora this year, just as in past years I have intentionally sought out LGBTQ plus stories from members of the queer community. So here are my five star reads from 2022. I'm going to discuss the fiction titles I read first and then the nonfiction. Red Panda and Moon Bear by Jared Roseo. This book was a recommendation from my husband. He finished it while we were on a road trip and then told me that I had to read it immediately. So when we got checked into the hotel, I checked it out from Hoopla and was not disappointed. This series is about two Cuban American siblings who have superpowers and are protecting their neighborhood while walking the streets after school. Uh, there are aliens, dogs, alien dogs. It's all just fantastic. Narwhal, Unicorn of the Sea by Ben Clanton. Uh, this is another comic. I think Victor bought it at the thrift store earlier this year. And it's just a delightful kids book about a happy-go-lucky narwhal far away from home who meets a cynical jellyfish and forms a newfound family. It's adorable and weird and I love it. Next we have Ar Shah and the Nectar of Immortality by Roshani Chokchi. This is the fifth book in the Aru Shah series or the Pandava Quintet. I read the first four books last year and this was a beautiful conclusion to the series. This is about the reincarnation of epic heroes, only they were discovered when they were preteen girls to start their epic quests instead of adults who were capable. And seeing the kids grow up throughout the series is beautiful, and I loved how the story concluded. Family is messy and difficult, but it was a good series. Spy Family by Tatsuya Endo. I read volumes 2 through 10 this year. I only keep up with two currently running series of manga, and Spy Family is one of them. This series is about a spy who has to go undercover as a family man, so he adopts a little girl who, unbeknownst to him, is able to read minds, and he finds a civil servant to take as a wife who, unbeknownst to him, is an assassin who is using him to avoid suspicion. Uh, it is funny, smart, action-filled, and is one of the weirdest and most wonderful series in the world. I love it. Um, next we have Teen Titans Beast Boy Loves Raven by Cami Garcia and Gabriel Piccolo. This is the third book in the Teen Titans series of OGMs. I enjoyed the Raven book and the Beast Boy book, but this is the first book I've really loved. It is such a fun and realistic way to see the team getting together. I enjoyed the young adult romance, the action, and moments of espionage. Uh, it was really fun and kind of nostalgic since I loved Teen Titans growing up. Next we have Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe. This is young adult historical fiction about being a Chinese lesbian in San Francisco during the 1950s. I read a fair amount of historical fiction set during this time, but I have to say this was my favorite. I sometimes read historical fiction about being a woman during this time, 
the Red Scare or the Lavender Scare or being Asian American after World War II. But very rarely do I get to see this combination, this exploration of having multiple identities in a politically fraught time. Next on the list is Loveless by Alice Oseman. This was a neat novel about someone who goes to university obsessed with romantic comedies only to slowly come to the realization that they are aromantic and asexual and that that's not what's in their future. I have loved Alice Oseman's comics, but getting into her prose writing this year has been delightful. Next, If This Gets Out by Sophie Gonzalez. This is a young adult contemporary novel about two members of a boy band, kids who have been best friends for years, falling in love. Uh, and now, I guess they're young adults now, but their record company wants them to keep a, a secret that they're dating and for each of them to stay in the closet. A Magic Steeped in Poison by Judy Ilin. This is a beautiful fantasy series based on Chinese mythology and the magic system is based on tea. I'm going to be honest, I did love this book. It was weird and smart and fun, but really what puts this over the edge is the cover. The cover art is so phenomenal and beautiful that even if I hated the book, I might have bought it. We also have Iron Widow by Zero and Jay Shao. This science fiction absolutely lived up to the hype. It's feminist, it's queer, it's vengeful and angry, and it's also based on Chinese history. It is violent and weird and fantastic, and I loved every second of it. Switching to nonfiction, uh, there's Mouse by Art Spiegelman. This is a nonfiction comic, a memoir about the artist's father and their family's time during the Holocaust. It was written during the 1980s and was banned earlier this year by a school board in Tennessee. This incident was widely publicized, which is one reason why I read it with Narali as part of our banned books book club. I don't know if I would have read it if the news hadn't been widely spread after that book ban, which does make me worried about all of the quiet book bans that impact communities every day without anybody speaking up about it. Next is Minor Feelings, An Asian American Reckoning by Kathy Park Hong. This is a series of autobiographical essays from a Korean American author about mental health, generational trauma, her relationship to the English language, and female friendship. It really just spoke to me. We also have Whimsical Stitches by Lauren Espy. This is a book of crochet patterns. I think they are well written, and the things I make come out cute. I'm a particular fan of the jellyfish pattern, but I've made several pieces from this book. We also have Hood Feminism, Notes from the Woman That a Movement Forgot by Nikki Kendall. This book was published at the beginning of 2020, and I read it shortly after the Roe vs. Wade decision was overturned. It is a series of essays that investigates the failures of mainstream feminism, and it was damning. It was also depressing. But I think it was worth reading, and I would recommend more people pick it up. I think we need solidarity now more than ever because of the ways we failed to show solidarity and mainstream feminism in the past. Another piece of nonfiction that was really fantastic was Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. This is a beautiful series of essays from Indigenous author and botanist about the ways that academia has overlooked and ignored Indigenous knowledge and how we can start to address that and be better. Uh, this book made me want to be more conscientious about what I consume and how I behave in the world. And finally, I believe this is the last book on the list, Disability vs. Ability, First Person Story Through the 21st Century, edited by Alice Wong. I grew up with a blind parent, and because my mom always sought out community, I've spent a lot of my life around disabled people, mostly blind people. And because of that, I've been in some ways surrounded by the disability justice movement because I saw what injustices were being done and how inaccessible our world is. And I wanted to fix it when I was a kid. And I saw some disabled adults doing things to fix it. Getting to hear more firsthand accounts from disabled people that I otherwise wouldn't have access to was great because now I actually have the resources to help make this a more accessible and better world. So that's the list. Every year when I review the things that I have loved over the past year, uh, it really gives me a moment to reflect on what I've valued in the past year, what I've learned, what I've enjoyed, and how I've grown. This moment of reflection also helps guide me in what I want to spend time on in the next year. Maybe more series of essays, maybe more nonfiction. I don't know. 
I know I am going to spend the next year building up long-lasting Asian American political power in Pennsylvania. I am going to spend the next year trying to learn deeply from people with different areas of expertise. I am going to spend the next year allowing myself to have fun with children's literature and comic books. And I am going to fight for a world where the next generation doesn't have to fight quite so hard. These were good books. I really like them. And I hope if you decide to pick them up that you like them too. That's all for me for now, but if you want to keep up with everything I'm doing, please subscribe, watch another video of mine, or support me on Patreon. And hey, I love you.